Please welcome the President of the American Academy of Nursing, Karen Cox, and President-elect, Eileen Sullivan Marks. As we begin the evening, we have one special guest and two colleagues who received awards with us. And first, it is my honor and pleasure to introduce our special guest, Congresswoman Eddie Bernice Johnson. She is a true pioneer who is serving her 13th term representing the 30th Congressional District in Texas. Congresswoman Johnson is the first nurse elected to the United States Congress. Congresswoman, we applaud your tireless efforts as an elected official and thank you for a lifetime of service. We are delighted you are joining us tonight and welcome you to make some remarks. Good evening. I'm delighted to join you this evening and let me thank you for the introduction uh, and say hello to the entire American Academy of Nursing. I it is certainly my privilege to be present as the guest to Dr. Bernadine Lacey, who is a living legend. And I'm very proud to stand here and tell you that my proudest achievement was that of becoming a nurse. I really don't know what profession prepares you to do anything better than nursing. When you think about how much you are taught to concentrate on the facts, to be open, flexible, ready for emergencies, avoiding panic, <laughs> quick sound decisions, keeping discipline. What else do you really need to work in the Congress? <laughs> So let me just say that I was also the first nurse to be elected to the Texas House of Representatives and the first nurse to be elected to the Texas Senate. And so, I didn't think about it that much because like every other nurse, I volunteered in the community and kept up with current affairs. And so I was encouraged to seek public office. My first mentor in public office was a federal judge, Judge Sarah T. Hughes, who was a judge who presided over Ray, uh, Roe v. Wade uh, in Dallas, Texas, but one of the first female federal judges in Texas. The person who gave me my first job so that I could work while being, because I was working for the federal government, was Stanley Marcus at the Neiman Marcus Company. So I've had really good support along the way. One of my first employees was Lucy Johnson, the youngest daughter of Lyndon, Lyndon Johnson president, because she was in nursing and dropped out <laughs> to get married. So she wanted to continue to support a nurse. We remain very good friends today. And so I'm, I'm delighted to be here with you tonight. And I must tell you that I need more nurses in public office. I 
I am on my way to my 14th term. And I have been in the majority six years out of 20. There's a slim possibility that I'll be in a majority after this coming election. And if that is the case, I will probably become the first female and first African-American chairperson of the Science, Space, and Technology Committee. And I have not achieved any of it without keeping in touch with nurses. I'm not on any committee that deals directly with nursing, but I try my best never to forget that I have a responsibility to professions, so we are always doing something about introducing legislation as it affects nurses. And I call on many of you, and you respond, and I appreciate that. And let me just say that I know a lot more of you than you know me, because I read and keep up with what you're doing, and I'll be forever proud that I chose nursing as a profession. Thank you. Thank you, Congresswoman. I also want to acknowledge awards given earlier today at the Institute for Nursing Leadership Workshop to two health policy pioneers, Barbara Given and Claire Murray. <clears throat> Dr. Given and Ms. Murray were given the Policy in Action Award for their tenacity and drive working with a coalition to advance the state of New York to a state where nurses have 10 years from licensure to complete their BSN. It's and it, okay. They are a reminder that important policy work takes time and long-term commitment. You'd like to ask them to stand and be recognized. Tonight's Living Legends Ceremony and Dinner are made possible by generous support from Cedars-Sinai Medical Center. Thank you once again for helping to make this a very special evening. And now, let's celebrate our 2018 Living Legends. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the 2018 American Academy of Nursing Living Legends, Jacqueline C. Campbell, Marilyn P. Chow, Joanne M. Dish. Ada K. Jaycox. Beatrice J. Kalish. Sally L. Lusk. And Ruth McCorkle.
The American Academy of Nursing created the Living Legends in 1994 in order to honor and recognize fellows who had made unique, outstanding, and long-lasting contributions to both the profession of nursing and to society. Since that time, we have honored 109 distinguished individuals as living legends. I would like to take a moment to recognize the living legends that are here tonight with us. Would those living legends among us please stand? We have a special request for all living legends. We would like all living legends in attendance tonight to join us for a photo on stage at the end of tonight's program. Thank you all for being role models and an inspiration for past, present, and future generations of nurse leaders. Together, tonight we gather to recognize seven living legends whose vision, leadership, and contributions have left an indelible mark on healthcare and advance the nursing profession. It is my pleasure to introduce tonight's first 2018 living legend, Jacqueline Campbell. <laughs> Dr. Campbell is a world-renowned leader, scientist, scholar, and pioneer in the investigation of violence and abuse against women including intervention, risk assessment, prevention, and treatment. She is also a unique and outstanding mentor and role model to numerous students, faculty, researchers, and scientists. Currently the Anna D. Wolf Endowed Professor at Johns Hopkins School of Nursing, Dr. Campbell has served at the university for 25 years. She has been the principal investigator on 14 federally funded collaborative research investigations, and her early work resulted in numerous publications that created the evidence base for the now recognized field of research on violence against women. Her most recent work has been foundational for the intersection of HIV AIDS and violence against women, as well as for showing how head injuries I got to know Jackie because I chaired the search committee that brought her to Johns Hopkins in 1993. 
Our relationship has many unique characteristics. One of them is, of course, that original hiring. But another is, we both worked very hard at our science and our teaching and our mentorship, while we had to learn to balance work and family. And Jackie has done a splendid job. She can't help herself from working, but her family, she lets them help her, and they recharge her batteries and they give her balance. Jackie is extraordinary in several respects. One, as a master student, she wanted to know why young women died and went to the Vital Statistics Bureau and found out that the main cause of death in the 20s and 30s year old women was murder. And moreover, she saw that the majority of those deaths were caused by a known perpetrator. This was the beginning of her lifelong passion and commitment to domestic violence against women. She not only has done this as a nurse interested in a particular subgroup of patients, but she took her nursing expertise and her research data and got involved in policy. She will go anywhere, anytime to carry forward the evidence that she launched the creation of to say this is a problem and it's a problem that needs detection, treatment and prevention. Jackie is deserving of the Living Legend Award because she has done so much, so well and with such impact that there are very few people who can acclaim the same success. Affecting legislation, affecting national health policy reimbursement, affecting the work of the Institute of Medicine, National Academy of Medicine on international violence to include violence against women, which is not a topic that in many societies is easily brought forward. Thank you. They've limited me terribly in my remarks. And you know I could go on and on, and there are so many people in this room that have done so much to mentor me and to lift me up. Dr. Martha Hill being one of them, also a living legend, who unfortunately can't be here, but um, as you saw, was bound and determined to do that video, to whom I owe a ton. I have been so fortunate to have many deans. My current dean, Dr. Patricia Davidson, Johns Hopkins University School of Nursing, to whom I owe a ton. Um, my kids are here, Brad and Christy. And Christy's a pediatric nurse practitioner, of which we are very proud. Brad has also found himself in the healthcare industry. He can tell you about what wonderful things he's doing. And the love of my life, Reg. As you heard, uh, you know, some of my early mentors are here. Suzanne Feedham, Peggy Chin, Nancy Fugate Woods, who was the first one that thought I was worth saying something in a policy arena. My friend, co-author, Janice Humphreys, a lot of Dukies, you might hear a little bit of Duke going on there, uh, of which I am an alum and incredibly proud to be so. And then the nurse faculty. Um, I love you all. As I said, one of the best chapters of my life was running that program. And I thank Mary Joan Ladin, who helped run it with me, Angela Barron McBride, who was the other thought leader there. There's many of you that were on the National Advisory Committee. I thank you all so much. And thank you to the American Academy of Nursing for giving me this incredible award. And thank you, my fellow living legends. What company to be in. So thanks much.
The next 2018 living legend to be recognized is Marilyn Chow. Dr. Chow's leadership has spanned practice, policy, academic, and professional organization. She has been a pioneer in advanced practice nursing, community health, technology, and diversity. Recently retired from her role as Vice President of National Patient Care Services and Innovation at Kaiser Permanente, she is a professor of nursing at the University of California, San Francisco. Early in her career, Dr. Chow was appointed President of the Social Services Commission in San Francisco during the unfolding HIV AIDS epidemic and acquired over $1 million in state funding for HIV AIDS training for nurses with a train the trainer approach that became a model for the nation. A graduate of one of the first classes of nurse practitioners in the nation, Dr. Chow co-authored the landmark reference textbook, Handbook of Pediatric Primary Care, and has been a leader in the education and credentialing of advanced practice nurses. She advocated for advanced practice nurses through her services on key committees, including being chair of the ANA Council of Primary Health Care in 1978. She served as a member of the HHS Division of Nursing Advisory Group on Workforce Projections for Nurse Practitioners and Nurse Midwives in 1993. Dr. Chow's leadership has also focused on the use of technology to improve health care. She was the driving force in creating Kaiser Permanente's Garfield Innovation Center, a clinical simulation laboratory for developing and testing innovations to rethink the provision of care. She spearheaded the KP National Nursing Electronic Health Record Collaborative of 38 hospitals. Dr. Chow played a leading role in the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Technology Drill, Drill Down, a program implemented by the Academy that highlighted the necessity to include nurses in the design and evaluation of healthcare technologies. She applied this work to a Kaiser Permanente project known as Smart Care that provided a roadmap for the integration of technology into the clinical environment. Dr. Chow's research and innovation in the care setting has been transformative. She was a co-investigator of a national time and motion study that used a tracking device to show where nurses were spending their time during an eight or 12 hour shift. This work was responsible for major policy changes nationwide in efficiency and safety improvements that enabled nurses to spend more time with their patients. As founding director of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Executive Nurse Fellows Program, <laughs> Dr. Chow created an intense, and as someone who knows, it was intense a three-year fellowship program for nurse leaders, which she led from 1997 through 2011. Over her 14 years at the helm, this program touched the lives and enhanced the careers of 220 nurse leaders, many of whom are in this room tonight, and whose impact continues today. Dr. Chow's career also reflects her understanding that nursing's leadership and diversity are crucial to its effectiveness. She has provided guidance and direction for ethnic minority issues at the state and national level. She chaired the California Coalition of Minority Nursing Organizations in 1995 and developed a state minority outreach project that targeted Hispanic high school students. Dr. Chow also provided leadership for the formation of the Asian American Pacific Islanders Nurses Association in 1999, and served on the ANA Ethic, Ethics and Racial Minority Fellowship Program. Let's hear more from Dr. Janet Heinrich, one of Marilyn Chow's sponsors. I know Marilyn for, oh, so many years. <laughs> First time met her when I was in the Division of Nursing and she was asked to be on special panels. And our careers have been intertwined ever since, both in terms of being good colleagues and being good friends. I think what's unique about Marilyn, 
she's working with the nurses on the front lines to really address problems. So if it's machinery or technology that's getting in the way, then pull people together and let's solve how we can make the interface of nursing, nursing care, technology work better, making sure that the patient is at the center of all our care and all the problem solving. Marilyn's modus operandi is to problem solve and get things done. She was a co-founder of the Garfield Innovation Center. She positioned herself there at Kaiser Permanente as a nurse leader, nurse director, but you know she didn't have to do director's work as we normally think of it. Um, she created a position for herself where she was a consultant essentially to the entire system. She created a job where she was paid to think and to be creative. Um, now not many of us have been able to do that. Marilyn's very deserving of this award because of the way she cares for people, incorporates other people's ideas, and is doing on the ground problem solving that will make a difference to uh, our patients and our populations and make them uh, as healthy as they can be. Dr. Chow, please join me to accept your award. I love the sign, breathe, smile, have fun. <laughs> Thank you to the Academy Board of Directors, to the Academy for this very special honor. And with special appreciation to my sponsors, in addition to Jan Heinrich, Linda Burns Bolton, Diana Mason, and their collaborators, Marla Salmon and Catherine Gillis. I have been blessed in my life. I won life's lottery. <laughs> and probably everybody in this room also believes they have won life's lottery. I've been blessed to be a second generation Chinese girl from Hawaii, first generation to go to college, to be raised by caring parents, to be encouraged, supported by family, friends, mentors, and colleagues, many of you in this room, and especially my husband and partner of 45 years, John. <laughs> the man behind the woman. It was my great fortune to find my passion and pursue it, to have the remarkable opportunities to make a difference in nursing and healthcare, to be a pioneer, as Karen mentioned, spanning education, clinical practice, health policy and politics, research, innovation, technology, and executive leadership. Reflecting on career, the, these are the lessons and guides that I found most valuable for making things happen. Things that I learned in Senator Inouye's office with Pat DeLeon, who's in the office. Thank you, Pat. First, focus on your vision and what you want to accomplish. Be persistent. Do your homework. Make it easy for others to help you. Make it easy for others to help you has new meaning for me now as I face one of the biggest personal challenges in my life. Learning to live with Parkinson's disease. <laughs> J 
John and I call it the new normal, or TNN. Making it easy for others to help you requires the leader to be patient, to learn to ask for help, to learn to take care of self. Imagine that. <laughs> so remember, as you pursue your work passion, take care of you. Only you can do that. Find joy and fun in every day. Most important, live, laugh, and love. Our third living legend to be recognized is Joanne Dish, a past president of the Academy. <laughs> Dr. Dish has spent her professional life negotiating the divide between nursing service and nursing education and has served as a leader in every type of healthcare related organization. For example, she started her career as a staff nurse in cardiovascular intensive care has served as a chief nurse executive at two major medical centers, interim dean at the University of Minnesota School of Nursing, president of two associations, and chair of the National Board of AARP. She currently is the inaugural chair of the board of directors of Advocate Aurora Healthcare and chair of the board of trustees of Chamberlain University. Dr. Dish served as Director of Medical Nursing, Emergency Nursing Services, and Dialysis at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania, <laughs> where they have since established the Joanne Dish Excellence in Nursing Practice Award. She has also served as Chief Nurse Executive at the University of Minnesota Hospital and Clinic and the Fairview University Medical Center. At Fairview, she melded two nursing departments, one unionized, one union free, into a vibrant whole. In 1989, she co-created the American Association Critical Care Nurses set of competency statements for differentiated nursing practice in critical care. In 1992, she developed the AACN's recommendations for action to educators, critical care in the nursing curricula. Under her leadership as president of AACN, the organization instituted a number of new initiatives, and she used her position to reach out to the American Nursing Association leaders to improve relations between ANA and the specialty nursing organizations. Dr. Dish left her mark on our academy during her board service and as president from 2011 to 2013. She began conversations with leaders of the ABIM Foundation that set in motion the Choosing Wisely campaign. She also spearheaded the Raise the Voice campaign with our signature Edge Runner program. As one of the founding leaders of the Quality and Safety Education for Nurses, CUSIN, initiative funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, Dr. Dish played a major role in seeing that CUSIN had a transformational effect on standard setting, nursing education, and interprofessional, interprofessional clinical practice concerning patient safety. The outcomes from her nine-year engagement with CUSIN initiative bridge competencies of quality across students, faculty, and clinicians, and enabled sustainability through a train-the-trainer institutes and specific follow-up with 22 schools. Dr. Dish's leadership extends to service with health systems and state commissions, including as a member of the Minnesota Healthcare Commission, the steering committee of the Minnesota Alliance for Patient Safety, the Quality Committee and Board of the Alina Health System in Minneapolis, the Quality Committee of the Board for Hennepin Health System in Minneapolis, and as a member and chair of the Board of Aurora Health Care in Milwaukee. For 50 years, Joanne Dish has utilized her talent in boundary-spanning ways to strengthen the relationship 
between clinical sites and schools of nursing, between nurses and physicians, and between clinicians and administrators. She has made bold contributions advancing quality and patient safety, and she has had a transformative effect on a host of major organizations, several health systems, and various universities. And now, Dr. Angela Baron McBride, one of Joanne Dish's sponsors, has more to add. I know Joanne originally through her reputation. When I became a dean, I was really interested in bringing service and education together. And I heard highly of Joanne, and then I invited her to give a lecture, the first lecture that was done to honor the interface at our place between service and education. The thing that makes her extraordinary is how she has used leadership in professional organizations to change the profession of nursing, to actually change healthcare in this country. Her leadership in the American Association of Critical Care Nurses led to uh, new standards of practice in critical care. It led to certification. When she was president of the American Academy of Nursing, our beloved organization, uh, she was one of the people majorly responsible for the Raise the Voice campaign. Joanne has been able to, using the concept of the lens of nursing, to help us really think through what is the unique perspective that we bring to bear. She inspired me to be more of a, a leader who does what she does, which is bridging service and education. Joanne is an inspiration to us as somebody who is the fullness of what we are and also what we hope to be. And I want to grow up to be like that. The Living Legend Program is for people who are leaders among leaders. It's a designation for the best among us. And Joanne is a leader among leaders. Dr. Dish, please join me to accept your award. Years ago, this past June, I graduated from nursing school. I'm, I'm proud of that too. And I began a wonderful career in nursing, not sure where it would take me. Tonight is quite the exclamation point, a bookend, if you will, on that career, although it's not over. And I, I do want to thank the Academy Board. I want to thank my sponsors, along with Angela, Susan Grunwald, Connie Delaney, and, and so many of you in this room. Um, there are so many things that one could say, uh, and it's hard to choose, uh, so many people we could thank. But there are two points that I think I want to share with you. Uh, receiving this honor does prompt you to think about uh, your career and, and the people and, and uh, what you may have contributed to accomplishing, because nobody does it by themselves. We would all know that. But the two points that I want to share is, first, um, Claire Fagan, many years ago, uh, was talking to a group of us at Penn, and she said, nursing has been good to us, and it certainly has. I've been able to do meaningful work, travel around the world, work on important projects, uh, network uh, with many of you in this room, my critical care buddies, the other QCNistas, Academy Fellows, um, work with so many of you on so many projects, and really have a lot of fun along the way. Uh, I also think of the words, when I think of nursing and how good it's been to me, I think we have in turn tried to give back. But I think of the words of Claire and Donna Deers, that uh, we nurses are tough, canny, 
powerful, autonomous, and heroic. I also like what a Boston cab driver said about us when he learned I was a nurse at an ANA convention in Boston many decades ago. He said, ah, nurses, caring, shrewd, a little bit crazy. <laughs> I think all of those adjectives apply to us. And I knew exactly what he meant, because we are shrewd, we do care, uh, and we do make things happen. And we know what happens at 2 in the afternoon is different than what happens at 10 p.m. on a Saturday night. And, and organizations and boards and uh, the legislature does need us. The second point that I've been thinking a lot about is it's all about the people. And again, nothing we do um, is by ourselves. I have a wonderful group here with me tonight, certainly my beloved wife, Jane, who has been my soulmate uh, for 38 years since we were at Michigan together, who routinely, who routinely lifts me up and keeps me grounded. My sister and her husband, Ike, have been with me every step of the way and could not be more supportive. So I thank them. I have wonderful friends here um, and uh, people that have been with me through the highs, the lows, the disappointments, the retirements, the resignations. And then again, many of you in the audience uh, that we shared a special time together at some point on a project or an initiative. And I remember all those things and I wanna thank you. I also remember a few people that didn't think I was so swell and uh, did teach me a lot though. And uh, one of those people was an admissions director at a very prestigious school of nursing who you would recognize immediately. But uh, not only rejected my application, I had partied a little too much at UW-Madison in my undergraduate days. Um, but Marguerite Kinney at UAB said, you know what, we'll take a chance on you. So down I went to Birmingham with Liz Carlson, uh, the two Yankees that were there that year. Um, so Marguerite was a big help to me. I remember a COO uh, when I was chief nurse who fired me saying, you know, I don't think you're nuts and bolts enough for us. And I think I probably wasn't. Uh, I felt something different was needed, but, but I learned a lot because Sandy Edwardson at Minnesota School of Nursing said, come on and join our team. And so I was so privileged to go to Minnesota and spend 13 years at the Densford Center. So what I've learned, what I've learned is that what sometimes seems as a setback, if you have an open mind and helpful friends and colleagues, a setback can become a stepping stone. And that's been my experience. So the good times and the bad times, at the end of the day, information is power, but relationships are the key. I tell nursing students I'd choose nursing tomorrow for the important work, but the people, both the patients, the families, my colleagues, and, and some new colleagues that are not nurses, but they're beginning to really understand what it is they need from nurses, have enriched my whole life, my career, and I wouldn't have missed it for anything. Thank you so much. The fourth living legend to be recognized this evening is Ada Jaycox. Ada Jaycox is best known for her research on pain, her leadership in moving nursing research into the National Institutes of Health, her advocacy for nurses and nursing, and her generosity as a mentor. Dr. Jaycox is Professor Emerita of the University of Maryland and Wayne State University. And whether at these institutions, the University of Iowa, or elsewhere, she has mentored hundreds of students, including at least 25 Academy Fellows and three Academy Living Legends, Mara Dean Moss, Marge Miles, and a new living legend we will honor in a few minutes, Ruth McCorkle. Dr. Jaycox began studying nursing pain assessment and management at the University of Iowa. Despite the fact that most nursing research at the time was focused on nursing education, Dr. Jaycox believed that nursing research should inform clinical nursing. 
pain alleviation through nursing intervention funded by the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare in 1973 was foundational to Dr. J. Cox's career as a pioneer in the science of pain and pain management. In the 1970s, first as a member of the ANA Commission on Nursing Research and then as ANA First Vice President, Dr. J. Cox was a leader of a coalition that lobbied the U.S. Congress and the NIH regarding the importance of nursing research. She and Barbara Hansen organized the Legislative Action Subcommittee of the Commission on Nursing Research. Dr. J. Cox was instrumental in developing and executing ANA's strategic plan that was actualized in the establishment of the National Center for Nursing, later named the Nurse National Institute for Nursing Research. Dr. J. Cox was also an advocate for female faculty and gender equality. In 1979, she and two colleagues, Virginia Cleland and Rosella Schlotfeldt, had the courage to file suit to eliminate gender discrimination in TIA craft retirement benefits. For those of you who don't know, a lesser amount was paid to women, even though women contributed the same amounts as men. The rationale for the lesser benefit was that women live longer than men. <laughs> After eight years, the plaintiffs won, and to this day, women retirees have been paid equitable TIA craft benefits. <laughs> when Congress established the Agency of Healthcare Policy and Research, now the AHRQ, Interdisciplinary Evidence-Based Clinical Practice Guidelines Program in 1989, Dr. J. Cox was asked to chair the agency's guideline panel on acute pain. That became the first guideline published by AHRQ, and it was followed by the publication of the Cancer Pain Guidelines, which were translated into eight languages. The guidelines directly resulted in the establishment of pain management standards by the Joint Commission and the National Comprehensive Cancer Center's pain guidelines, which is used in every comprehensive cancer center across the country. When AHRQ closed their program in response to lobbying by specialty organizations, Dr. J. Cox founded the American Pain Society's Clinical Practice Guidelines Program and directed the development of guidelines for pain management in sickle cell disease, arthritis, and fibromyalgia. Dr. Meridine Moss, one of Ada J. Cox's sponsors, will tell us more. I met Ada for the first time in the early 70s, and at that time she was a new young professor at the College of Nursing at the University of Iowa. And I was working with some other colleagues in a large long-term care facility for veterans. We knew we didn't have the training to evaluate or describe what was going on systematically. So we ran off to the University of Iowa to, to get help. And eventually I got, we got referred to Ada. And she and I discovered rather quickly that we were soulmates in that what we aspired to and what we wanted to happen with nursing. Ada is a risk taker. She was one of the nurse leaders at the time who advocated for an institute of nursing research in NIH. And that was a fair amount of risk because there was an existing division of nursing and ultimately, she chaired the guidelines that were funded by AHCPR and a the American Pain Society to develop evidence-based guidelines about assessment and uh, treatment of pain. Ada's contributions to nursing have been uh, really seminal. She knew what was important for nursing and, and uh, worked to the extent that she could to make those things happen. Ada J. Cox is a true living legend. I don't have any hesitation in saying that.
Dr. Jay Cox, please join me to accept your award. Thank you for the, my mentees, Meredith Maas, Kitty Buckwalter, and Christine Myaskowski, and their advisor, Barbara Redman, for their confidence in me. My own mentors, Luther Christman and Rosella Schlotfeld, were early members of this group. There's another nurse who I never met, but I think we have some parallels. It was Lavinia Dock, who was born in 1858. She was very small. Her first position was at Johns Hopkins University when that program was just beginning and it was a diploma apprenticeship type program. She taught student nurses in their first year. Uh, I went there 100 years later and started the PhD program in nursing. Now, <laughs> it took us 100 years, but we finally got there. <laughs> Lavinia Dock also published uh, the first pharmacology text in nursing because she thought that if nurses were administering medications, they should be based on whatever good evidence we had. And so she published the Materia Medica, uh, Medica in 1908. Eighty years after that, I was privileged to help in the development of clinical practice guidelines for the management of pain, which of course had the same principle underlying it, use the best science for delivering practice. She was also a suffragette. And almost exactly 100 years ago, along with other suffragettes, she picketed the White House uh, in, in, um, for women's rights. Uh, she and her fellow suffragettes were thrown into jail for their effort. I'd like to say that I was never thrown in jail, <laughs> but I would like to say, Lavinia! You're needed at the White House again. <laughs> I've had a long and satisfying career, and this is a wonderful way to end it. I thank you again, my mentors, my mentees, and the board of the Academy. Our fifth living legend to be recognized tonight is Beatrice Kalish. Dr. Kalish is an internationally known scholar who has made numerous contributions to the advancement of nursing and healthcare, primarily in the areas of public perception of the nurse, the nurse work environment, and patient safety. She is currently the Shirley Titus Professor Emeritus at the University of Michigan. Her earliest research work was on the history of nursing, which resulted in an award-winning book, The Advance of American Nursing, which traced the history of nursing from the time of Florence Nightingale to the present. Dr. Kalish made a tremendous impact with her next focus on the image of nursing. Three studies involved content analysis of 497 motion pictures and 2,133 television programs with major nurse characters, as well as over 10,000 newspaper articles containing the subject of nurses and nursing. This program of study, through many publications, congressional testimony, and professional conference presentations, aided both nursing and the public in understanding that the nurse was not being viewed as a knowledgeable professional. Through this program of scholarship, Nursing deliberately advanced more professional images in organizational marketing and in public media. The staff nurse began to be depicted more accurately as not only caring, but also a skilled healthcare provider who made critical evidence-based decisions for patients and families. The books she authored in this area include Images of Nurses on Television 
and the changing image of the nurse. While on leave from the University of Michigan, she was appointed principal at Ernst & Young, where she conducted organizational assessments and interviewed hundreds of frontline nurses. Dr. Kalish learned that care was being missed and nurses were experiencing moral distress because of it. Due to her scholarly approach, nurses responded positively to learning about what care was missed most often, what danger was posed to patients, and how they, as colleagues, might help each other to avoid miscare. Systematically, she developed several instruments to measure miscare and studied the relationship of miscare to patient outcomes such as falls. Interventions such as nursing teamwork were developed and tested in order to decrease the errors of omission and improve patient outcomes. Dr. Kalish also has impacted nurses' role in the policy and political arena with articles such as a discourse on the politics of nursing in the American Journal of Nursing Administration in 1976 and the promise of power in nursing outlook in 1978. Both articles serve to introduce nurses to the importance of becoming politically active and comfortable with exercising power. These articles were reprinted in several publications, including the Congressional Record. Dr. Colleen Good, one of Beatrice Kalish's sponsors, has more to add. I knew me early on in the 1980s. I got to hear her speak, and uh, from that time on, I've just always appreciated so much the work that she has done for nursing and how she's advanced our nursing. She was very, very focused on the work environment that nurses were in, and she did a fair amount of research to, to look at that and to understand how it needed to be changed. She was very instrumental in writing books about this, writing articles about it, and really showing um, the impact that, that uh, nurses had on the outcomes of patient care. Her publications and books uh, related to this really had a huge impact, I think, about how nurses and hospitals and other care, care facilities changed the work environment and changed the protocols for caring for patients based on her research and her textbooks. She works so hard with nurses all across the country and even, even in other countries to help them understand how much they impact the outcomes of patient care by the work that they do as a nurse. She has impacted nursing tremendously. She did a lot of research related to missed care when patients didn't get the care that they deserved. And she was able to, through her research, show how that happened and to correct it and then to get that into the teaching. Everyone in the profession respects her, not just nurses that re respect her as well, but other healthcare providers who have worked with her have this great respect for her, her knowledge. She's very, very smart. She's caring and she loves to tackle problems and study them and correct them through research. And that's an amazing talent of hers. Well, I think you'd be very lucky if you were in a hospital where she was in charge. Dr. Kalish, please join me to accept your award. so honored to be here tonight and short as usual. <laughs> I always have to go ahead and get a stool to stand on. Um, I'm grateful to be the recipient of this award. I'm especially thankful to a large number of amazing people who have made it possible for me to be here. <clears throat> 
To begin, I, when I was 12 years old, I was a candy striper. <laughs> Do you remember those? And I went, I was assigned to a polio unit where all the patients were on iron lungs, you know, and, the, and I would feed them, you know, I fed the patients. I thought, this is wonderful. I had this most positive feeling about what I was doing, that I'm going to be a nurse. It was sensed when I got on, when, some, when a nurse got on a bus I was on, um, probably when I was 15, and she had um, a, the navy blue coat with the red lining and the white, <laughs> white uniform, and I mean, I was awestruck. <laughs> I have to say the decision to become a nurse was one of the best decisions I've ever made. <clears throat> I'm grateful to my colleagues at the University of Michigan, including Dean Ada Sue Henshaw, who is one of the people who sponsored me for this award, to Philip Kalish, who was my co-investigator and co-author for many years, Christopher Fries, Sonia Duffy, just to name a few. Um, throughout my career, I've been fortunate to have a large number of different positions, from staff nurse to consultant for a a big eight counting firm. And in that role, I worked for many outstanding nurse executives. And uh, Christine DeLucas was one of them, and he, she came tonight. And I'm very grateful for that. It's a privilege to work with, it's been a privilege to work with her. But without my students, this award would never occur. And um, as a teacher, you have the opportunity to give close, meaningful relationships with students. One of my star undergraduate and graduate students, Suzanne Miramota, was just appointed to CEO of this academy. I think we're lucky, and I'm so happy. Um, I also owe a lot to the staff nurses in this country and around the world that revealed to me their honest opinions about their work and their challenges. And I dedicated my latest book to them because they really are my heroes. Um, along with Ada Sue, I thank Colleen Good, as you've seen on the video, who I've admired as a true role model and what a nurse executive could be and is, and Marla Weston, who was so supportive and helpful to me while I spent a year here in Washington at the Institute of Medicine. I also want to thank Kate Judge for her unrelenting support and Brendan Kennedy for pushing me to the limit. And last but not least, I want to thank my children, Melanie, who's here, and Philip, who brought me enormous joy. In conclusion, I've faced many challenges along the way, as we all have, and I, any successes I've had is due to the fact they didn't quit. So as Winston Churchill said, success is not final, failure is not fatal. It is the courage to continue that counts. So continue. <laughs>
randomized clinical trials of interventions to promote the use of hearing protection. Her subsequent study, funded by NIOSH, tested an intervention to increase construction workers' use of hearing protection. Using videos, training sessions, and manuals, she tested the effectiveness of the intervention on various worker populations. Later, research utilized a computer-based interactive program designed to increase factory workers' use of hearing protection. Beyond hearing loss, Dr. Lusk has examined how noise contributes to cardiovascular diseases, obesity, premature and low, ba low birth weight babies, mental illness, and more. Her project was the first to use ambulatory blood pressure monitoring on factory workers to demonstrate that as noise levels increased, blood pressure increased as well. Dr. Lusk promoted health and safety among a variety of underserved worker groups, delivering interventions that resulted in increased use of hearing protection devices to prevent hearing loss. Based on her work, NIOSH revised its mission by adding a new intramural research and service section devoted to studying behavioral factors and funding extramural behavioral research. Dr. Lusk has been instrumental in advancing occupational health nursing education. In the late 1970s, she led an effort to design a community-based VSN completion program for registered nurses at the University of Michigan so students could earn a quality BSN education while continuing to work. She also established the Masters in Occupational Health Nursing program as part of a NIOSH-funded center at the University of Michigan, and she served as its director for 20 years. Dr. Lusk obtained NIOSH funding to support students enrolled in the School of Nursing's PhD program in clinical nursing research. This was the nation's first NIOSH-funded PhD in nursing program. Dr. Lusk has provided significant leadership to the Midwest Nursing Research Society, serving as president, initiating the development and expansion of the MNRS Foundation, and as the first foundation president. Nationally, she has served on NINR study sections and an advisory board to the National Institute on Deafness and Communication Disorders. Internationally, she's delivered presentations at conferences around the world and provided consultations to international government agencies. One of Sally Lust's sponsors, Dr. Linda McCauley, will tell us more. I met Sally 30 years ago, and I had just finished my dissertation, and where I was working at the time, they wanted me to become involved in occupational health nursing and they told me to go talk to Sally Lusk at the University of Michigan about what she's doing with educating the next generation of nurse scientists who will advocate for workers and occupational health. So I remember so clearly learning from Sally, and I can't believe it was 30 years ago. <laughs> our work should be a great part of our health. And Sally actually was able to communicate that to scores of nurse scientists. She was mentored by Nola Pender in terms of health promotion and wellness and took that into the workplace. And it has been her mission for her entire academic and professional life to advocate for workers and occupational health. The impact she made is leading nursing to the forefront. It is, a, it is one of the few examples of how a nurse scientist influenced our government agencies, our funding agencies, to change what they were looking at, to change um, their funding priorities, to actually try to prevent hearing loss. I think Sally is deserving of a Living Legend Award because of the notable difference that she has made in occupational health. I believe she is the first living legend that has been known for occupational health nursing. It's significant, I'm proud of her, and so glad to, to be a part of this wonderful nomination and receipt of an award.
Dr. Lusk, please join me to receive your award. Thank you so much. I'm extremely honored and be over overwhelmed to be in this esteemed company and want to express sincere gratitude to my nominators, Dr. Linda McCauley, Nola Pender, and Joanne Dish, to the Selection Committee, and to the Academy Board of Directors. I've always identified with the old Pennsylvania Dutch saying, we grow too soon old and too late smart. I'd, I'd like to acknowledge all the support I've had to miti help to mitigate that characteristic. First of all, my parents and grandparents were thrilled to have me be the first in the family to earn a college degree. My immediate family is here tonight in force to support me, and I want to introduce them to you. My husband, John, who's always been my greatest supporter and cheerleader. I could share many examples, but you'll appreciate these early ones. He slipped into some sessions of my tough PhD course in multivariate analysis to try to help me with it. <laughs> and he arranged for word processing of my dissertation before it was even available at the University of Michigan. And he's continued to help ever since. Mike Lechleitner, my son, who is here with his wife, Teresa, my grandson, Clayton, and my granddaughter, Claire, when he was in an elementary school, he asked me, Mom, is school hard for you? And I said, why no, Mike, why do you ask? He said, well, you've been going for so long. <laughs> and that continued as I was a student all his life until I, he grew up <laughs> and left the nest. <laughs> But he was always tolerant, and he's a great success, despite his mother's distractions and part-time attention. And he and his family are wonderfully loving and supportive. My daughter, Heather Lusk, here from Hawaii, with her husband, Josh Jensen, and my son, Chris Lusk, here from Michigan, where his wife, Jessica, is home with our wonderful grandchildren. Although technically I'm their stepmother, we've disregarded that label, giving each other full love and support. I'm so pleased and grateful that most of my family was able to attend this special event. <clears throat> Next, there are so many colleagues, collaborators, consultants, and research team members who assisted me in my endeavors that there's no way I could begin to acknowledge them all, some of whom have joined my family here tonight in the cheering section. And for my early research program, I want to mention Vi Barkowskis, Joanne Dish, Ada Sue Hinshaw, Nola Pender, Jan Atwood, David Ranis, faculty colleagues, doctoral students, including Marjorie McCullough, who, uh, who's here, postdocs, including Wei Sang Hong, and dozens of research associates, including the Academy's new CEO, Susan Mirmetto, and a supportive network of OHNs, Linda McCauley and Mary Salazar are in that group. And then those skilled leaders who gave such great guidance as we embarked on the MNRS Foundation, Angela McBride, Joyce Fitzpatrick, Ada Sue Hinshaw, and Nola Pender. Accomplishments are only ever possible with a lot of help and support, and I've been so privileged to receive it. Given this opportunity here at the podium, I'm unable to resist sharing my passion. I want to ask for all your help to advance the policy brief adopted by the Academy to reduce our environmental noise exposures in order to prevent health problems and reduce disease in our country and the world. Back to the, <laughs> thank you. Back to the saying I began with, I've definitely gotten older, can't say a lot smarter, but it's the wonderful help of my family and colleagues that have made this evening possible and I am eternally grateful. Thank you so much for this incredible honor. And may you all be smart at a young age. Thank you. <laughs>
Our final living legend to be recognized tonight is Ruth McCorkle. Dr. McCorkle is a pioneer in oncology, nursing, symptom science, hospice and palliative care, and the management of chronic illness. She is the Florence Wald Professor Emerita of Nursing at Yale University and Pre Professor of Nursing Emerita at the University of Pennsylvania and continues on as a director of psychosocial oncology at Yale Cancer Comprehensive Center. Her leadership abilities first took her into the United States Air Force in 1964, where she volunteered for the Air Force Nurse Corps. Promoted to captain in 1966, she witnessed unimaginable suffering and premature deaths in Vietnam. The great depth of her ability to connect with patients came from her exposure to the extremes of human suffering in the war where she herself was exposed to Agent Orange. Dr. McCorkle continued her focus on seriously ill patients with another career-defining experience. Her pioneering work with the clinical studies to relieve symptoms and distressing symptoms associated with those at the end of life truly began when she studied at St. Christopher's Hospice, London, England, for the care of terminal patients. This time period focused her efforts on the symptom experience, and she went on to be a co-founder of the Hospice of Seattle and the Regional Oncology Society in the Northwest. In 1978, Dr. McCorkle developed the Symptom Distress Scale. This was the first instrument to measure the concept of distress associated with the presence of a physical or psychological symptom from the patient's perspective. In 1985, when the Food and Drug Administration required endpoints other than survival, her symptom distress, distress scale became widely used as an outcome measure and is now used worldwide by health professionals in many disciplines and has been translated into more than 10 languages. Dr. McCorkle was the first researcher to show that interventions by advanced practice nurses improve survival outcomes. She developed the standardized nursing intervention protocol, which was among the first interventions to bring psychosocial constructs to quality of life outcomes. This protocol has been used uh, globally by researchers and clinicians to measure symptom distress and widely modified for different cancers by other oncology researchers. In seven clinical trials spanning 30 years, Dr. McCorkle has tested the role of the advanced practice nurse on the quality of life and survival outcomes of patients diagnosed with cancer and their caregivers. Dr. McCorkle has a stellar academic nursing career at a variety of institutions across the country, including the University of Pennsylvania, the University of Washington, and the University of Iowa. She has formally mentored over 70 doctoral students and 30 postdocs. Elected in 1990 to the National Academy of Medicine, she is a charter member of five leading oncology and critical care journals and is past president of the American Psychosocial Oncology Society. Dr. Ann Kurth, one of Ruth McCorkle's sponsors, has more to add. Everyone in nursing knows Ruth McCorkle. She has been a, a stalwart for really 50 years. When I came to Yale just a few years ago as dean this time, having been a student years ago, I had the honor and pleasure of getting to know her as a faculty member. She's incredibly accomplished in her clinical area of oncology nursing. In fact, she's been called the godmother of oncology nursing. But she was also very early on a pioneer of the importance of interprofessionalism. So she has credibility and connections across the disciplines. And she was a very early on member of the Institute of Medicine, now National Academy of Medicine, 1990. Not many nurses in the National Academy of Medicine uh, at that time. But she's also been recognized by others, uh, again, outside of nursing. And that includes right at home in Yale, she was just given the, their uh, top award last year, the first nurse ever to get it. So in the field of cancer, where Ruth has done so much research over the years, she's come up with a distress scale that's in use around the world. We asked the patient, what are you experiencing? 
and what can we do about it to help with that? She inspires me because she has unfailing um, vigor and rigor, but also compassion and humor. She brings that wisdom from the old days and the fights that we went through, but always, always looking forward. And I think that's, that's the evergreen nature of her curiosity is what um, I think young people today can also be inspired by. She doesn't stop, never stops. The curiosity, the drive, the, the um, urgency around wanting to contribute, and she just keeps doing it. Ruth is incredibly deserving of this award, and it's very meaningful because it caps such a long and productive lifetime of contribution to nursing. And I think of Ruth in a way as a tree. She draws in these deep roots of what nursing focuses upon. Her own work is this straight shot of incredible achievement. She has mentored 70 PhD students and 30 postdocs. That's an astonishing number of leaves and seedlings that are out there. So there's a forest that Ruth McCorkle has seeded and we're all benefiting from that. Dr. McCorkle, please join me to accept your award. It's always hard to hear things about yourself. I'm appreciative that Ann Kurth, Ann Burgess, and Barbara Gibbon for nominating me for this honor. This is truly my moon landing event. In preparing my remarks, I reread Malcolm Gladwell's Outliers. I wanted to better understand why I have been singled out among my colleagues for this highest nursing honor. Gladwell says an outlier lies outside normal experience. An outlier is someone who does things out of the ordinary. Our success, Gladwell thinks, depends on the opportunities others give us, not our extraordinary talent. We have help from others to be successful. No one makes his or her way alone. This is certainly true for me. I was given the opportunity to be a pre-nursing student in high school. There I found my calling for nursing. I was placed in the operating room with role models who taught me the value of teamwork my tour in the United States Air Force Nursing Corps gave me the opportunity to learn about sacrifice and suffering. It prepared me for unimaginable loss to care for others. The GI Bill afforded me the opportunity to go to graduate school at the University of Iowa, where Ada J. Koss taught me to love research. Rosella Scott felt a frequent visitor to Iowa, encouraged me to get my doctorate and to apply to the University of Washington to work with Jean Benoliel. UW was my first full academic appointment. Kathy Barnard was my assigned mentor. At UW, I was nurtured and taught how to teach how to supervise graduate students, and how to write research grants. Barna Lepovetsky from NCI gave me the opportunity to apply for a pre and postdoc training grant. Barbara Jimino was my first doctoral student, and Reba Deturnye was my dean. From UW, I was given the opportunity to work at the University of Pennsylvania under Claire Fagan. Ellen Baer recruited me and handed me a funded training grant to develop our oncology program with Linda Jacobs. With Barbara Lowry, Neville Strump, Jackie Fawcett, 
we developed the Center for Advancing Care and Serious Illness, one of two NCNR P50 grants. John Glick gave me the opportunity to join the executive team at the Penn Cancer Center. In 1998, I had the opportunity to relocate to Yale to direct the direct doctoral program and work with Judy Krause, Catherine Gillis, Margaret Gray, and Vince DeVita. Rick Levin honored me with the Florence Wall Chair and established the Center for Excellence in Chronic Illness Care, where I worked with Gail Malkus, Debbie Chung, Sally Cohen, and Kathy Knaffel. With the untimely death of Donna Deers, I was given the opportunity to teach in her doctoral nursing practice program with Jane Dixon and Mark Glazenby. And there I have encountered a renewed commitment to translate research into practice. The DNP postmaster students have been some of the most exciting students I've ever worked with. And to have this joy in my life at this stage in my career is unbelievable. I've had so many opportunities to work collaboratively in research with my good friends, Barb and Bill Given, Robert Krauss, Marcia Grant, Ed Wagner, Peter Schwartz, Betsy Bradley, Melinda Irwin, and Herta Chow. Opportunities to work internationally with Cecily Saunders, Bob Tiffany, Richard Wells, Jimmy Holland, Vernice Ferguson, and Carol Reed Ash. Godwin believes success follows a predictable course. Success is not just the opportunities we are given, but it's also having the strength and the presence of mind to seize them. You must be hardworking, and for that, my parents guided my sister and me. They were the hardest working people we have ever known. Tonight, I say to you, for, nur for nursing to move ahead, and to be everything we want it to be, and need it to be. We must provide opportunities for nurses who are hardworking and will contribute to nursing's future. Tomorrow, make it a concerted effort to single out those nurses you know who contribute. Give them a chance and prove it. Create an opportunity for them to succeed so they can be tomorrow's living legend. I am grateful for the Academy for this honor and humbled to be among the six other nurses honored here tonight. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in another warm round of applause for our newest living legends. As a reminder, we'd like all living legends to come up to the po uh, to come up to the stage so we can do a group photo. For the rest of you, please enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. <laughs>